Hey, everybody. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for coming to Fest. This is so exciting. I am so excited to get to spend this time with you and that we get to spend this time with Davi Diggs. Yeah, the uh, Grammy-winning, Tony-winning, Oakland-born Davi Diggs, who's been in everything but Snowpiercer, Hamilton, Extrapolations, Blind Spotting. Or maybe you know him from Clipping. There might be some Clipping fans out there, too. Um, so, yeah. And also, later, we're going to be meeting two directors of a documentary series called The Class, which is all about how the pandemic affected Bay Area high school students' lives. And Davi Diggs, executive, produced that as well. So we're going to get to do a lot in this hour. So we should get started. And join me in welcoming Davi Diggs. <laughs> I'm going to sit down before I hug you. <laughs> that thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I just got to say that um, people might know this if they listen to Forum, but I like to prepare a lot for my interviews. Like I don't <laughs> feel comfortable unless I'm feeling super prepared. Yeah. And so um, uh, I realized in starting to prepare for this conversation with you that uh, it is very difficult to prepare for an interview with you. <laughs> And the reason is there is so much, no. right? You do so much. You told me that uh, backstage, and I don't. I, I think I've just been sitting at home with my kid. <laughs> I really like. I feel like I haven't done anything for the past year. So yeah, that's cool. That's good to hear. Somebody's doing their job. It ain't me. Ah. Yeah. Well, the way I put boundaries on this was I thought, okay, let me just look at what he's been doing the last few months, and then I'm like, okay, let me just see what he's been doing the last like month <laughs> and also you know what has been happening in david's life in the last month and uh and that helped that helped a lot but there is a lot even in that short period of time and one of the the first things that um i read about was that nickel boys had its yeah. new york film festival premiere yeah that film looks i watched only the trailer because it's doesn't have its wide theater yeah, yeah. release yet, but just from the trailer alone, it looks so beautiful. It's incredible. I really like, yeah, encourage people to see it. And I'm like, it's not, not really because of my involvement in it. I saw it, I saw it alone in a little screening room because they were like, would you want to do any promotion for this? I said, and it was just like, but I mean, uh -huh. it is really beautiful. I don't know if you know the Colson Whitehead novel, but it's, it's an incredible novel. Um, the, yeah, yeah, give it up for anything, anything, Colton Whitehead, but the, um, the director, Ramel Ross, did, uh, it's shot in a way that is unlike anything any of us have ever seen before, it's kind of like a new filmic language, and when I saw it, it was, immediately occurred to me that it was the only way to adapt a novel like that, that does a bunch of daring formal things to figure out what the filmic equivalent of that is. It makes, it, that novel does an incredible job of making a, a very difficult fact about our country very personal. And the film does the same thing by putting you directly in the bodies of the protagonists. And it is, it's, it's really unbelievable, so. I wanna dig into that a little bit, but we actually do have a clip, the, a clip of the trailer. So let's, let's give folks a chance to see it. Long time, long time, long time. Woo! That's it, Al. You're doing great. What happened to that one kid? I used to hang with all the time. You don't remember? Remember what? You really don't remember. I don't know what more you want me to remember. What are you gonna do? He's now or never. Hello. Ooh. 
the music too it just gets you the the back of the head we see in the trailer that's you that's my head that's about you saw everything i do in the movie in that trailer that's that's it so i read that right yeah. we only ever see the back of your head for the character you play who's so central well yeah so tell me tell i'm me i and I, I don't want to like give away too much i'm i'm uh an older version of one of the one of the characters who we're following um, and so, and I don't want to spoil the trick. It's a really great filmic trick in terms of why we're at that point in his life seeing the back of his head. Yeah. But, um, but the whole thing is shot in POV, sort of. That's the, the, the way they're using to describe it. Um, but it's, um, yeah. Anyway. You were okay with that. You were okay, like, when... It was because of it. I, I, the, the director called me, you know, like very apologetically, like, I want you to do this thing. It's gonna, it's like, it's not gonna be comfortable and it's not really, we're never gonna see your face. And, <laughs> uh, and like, here's the, the, it's a rig. It's like 40 pounds you gotta wear on your back. And I was like, yeah, yeah. What, that's, I'll, when are you ever gonna get to do that again? You know, I, I don't know. somebody pitches me a thing where I'm like, I will probably, this will probably be the only opportunity I ever have to do this. I'll generally say yes. That's the best way to get me to say yes to something is to pitch me a thing that sounds insane. <laughs> like, yeah, I'll do that. Did it change the way you performed it, knowing that? Yeah, I think, well, for me, when I got to set to shoot, again, I'm like, not really in this movie, uh, but like to shoot the, the little bit that I did, um, I immediately, they put the thing on me so I could feel it, you know, because they're like, it's going to be awkward or whatever. And then they say, you can take it off till shooting. I was like, do I have to? Or can you give me a monitor and let me like play around with how to move naturally with this thing on my back and like see wh what it sees versus what I'm seeing. So like, it, I, I just wanted them to have, it became very clear that I was jumping into something that was going to be gorgeous. I had asked them to send me, because I didn't, when he, pitched the POV thing to me, I didn't understand what he was talking about either. And so I asked if he could send me some dailies or whatever, and they sent the footage, and I said, oh, no, I don't want to fuck this up. You know, like, <laughs> this is, like, really a beautiful thing you're making, and, like, I'm just going to come here, this, like, bumbling dude with some thing on my back and mess it all up, and I, like... So I spent, like, several hours while they were shooting other things just, like, with a little monitor, like... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> like, just trying to... And then... Um, my scene partner came in and we worked on that a little bit and just wanting to, you know, if I pick something up, I want you to be able to see the thing that he's picking up because that's a relevant prop, but like if it's sitting over here, you can't see it. So like what, what looks natural, how, like that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was incredibly technical, which is sort of my favorite stuff. <laughs> the acting is pretty secondary. Is it really? <laughs> Generally for me, like I want, it's, I, I, I like figuring out if it's going to work. I, you know, performances, there are people who are great performers. That's fine. I, yeah. What, what do you love about, about acting, specifically? Because you do so many things, but let me ask you about acting. Mm, it's, it's generally that... Um, I think it plays in to one of my strengths, which is not caring, caring about something that's not my job. So, like, the, the great part about being an actor is you're responsible for a very small part of a story, but you're very responsible for it. But... I need to tell this one character's life all the way through in whatever time you give me. So we need to be clear that I was alive before this point. We need to be clear that I, unless I die in the thing, that I will be continuing to live after this point. And that's what I'm responsible for. And the rest of it, I am not responsible for, you know? That's the freeing thing about acting. It's like, yeah. I just have to figure out how this body embodies that idea and how I can be useful to tell a much greater story that is somebody else's job. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. Um, well, another very recent thing that happened was uh, the final episode of the final season of Snowpiercer just oh, aired. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that's a character that you had for, for four seasons? Yeah, four seasons. Yeah, four seasons, like almost Is six years. Is that the years. longest? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's the longest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's my longest relationship. <laughs> um, yeah. So you really, really got to do what you just described over... For a long time, yeah. I only, I got to care about very little about Snowpiercer <laughs> for six years. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, that, the, the TV relationship is a really interesting one between actor and writer's room. 
um, and it's unique. And this, I learned this on, I, I had done no TV until post Hamilton, and then I, and then I, I learned this on Blackish. The first time I ever went on Blackish, I, they gave me the script. We did the table read. Blah, blah, blah. Blackish is great because if you say the words that are on the page, you're going to be successful. It's very funny. Mm-hmm. The writers are great. Um, so you just have to show up and say the thing. And. Um, I showed up, and in the first scene we were shooting, it's something in the living room, and I was just like, oh, I'm just going to step, uh, I'm going to walk on the couch, because that's gonna that would drive uh, Anthony's character crazy, and like that's funny, and he's supposed to hate me, so that's great. So I just like walked on the couch. I didn't think anything of it. And then the scripts for the later episodes started showing up, and it would describe me doing other things like that, standing on the couch doing the scene direction. I was like, oh my God, what a crazy... For someone who comes from theater where you're working with a fixed document yeah. in television, the, the thing between actors and writers who you often don't meet is that like, they are responding in real time to the things that you're doing and vice versa. So that character gets broadened every new episode that exists with that character. And so Layton was a, a great, like, fun, sort of long-term experiment in that. And like, if, you know, if there's a thing that I do in this one episode, will that potentially show up later? What are the sort of like physical constraints on all of us as people? They kept asking me to sing. I kept saying no, you know, (laughs) shit like that. (laughs) Um, In that final season, Leighton, the character Leighton plays a dad. Yeah. Yeah. We shot it two years before I would become a dad. So like... Congratulations on becoming a dad this year. Thanks. Yeah, I wish I, I, there's. A, I've played a dad a few times uh, on things, and I wish I had them all to do over again. I got it t- so wrong. Okay. <laughs> what, what did you What did you get wrong? What would you uh, done differently? I did not uh, foresee the crippling anxiety. I think it was like the <laughs> the part of it that I didn't know. But also, um, I think. <laughs> I did that movie Trolls Band Together, you know, like voiced and like my character in that is like a dad of many children. <laughs> and one of my, Chinaka Hodge, one of my best. Yes, friends, I, I interviewed Chinaka uh, yeah, years yeah. ago. Years Chinaka ago. Chinaka is, um, she saw the movie and then she, she has a, a, a four year old, so then had to see it every day for many, many months. And, um, and she was like, You're so great. Your voice is so great. Uh, you, you say a lot of things. And we, I was, uh, we were pregnant at the time. She says, you say a lot of things casually, though, that are not casual. And I think that's exactly right. Like, I didn't like some of the just stuff about how life-changing parenthood is. You can just sort of say that as a throwaway. A lot of those lines, because they were seemed funnier to deliver, were like sort of throwaways or under my breath, and there's nothing casual about it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the, that's the biggest difference. Just I couldn't, I couldn't have even though as somebody who always wanted to be a father and how this is something that I've not unprepared for and like didn't, you know, but I, um, I think it was impossible to understand really what it means to have your life changed in that way. Yeah, really what it means to have your life change and, and learning that you have crippling anxiety. <laughs> I learned that I had like 10,000 defense mechanisms against feeling, like really feeling things yeah. <laughs> until I had a kid. It's wild. And then you just immediately feel everything and it is really uncomfortable. <laughs> Turns out like not being numb is super uncomfortable. <laughs> so do, yeah, do you, 100%, do you uh, ever miss being on stage? Have you done Always. a lot? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I can't wait to go back. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's mostly <laughs> a scheduling issue or anything, but... Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the last real play I got to do was was White Noise, which is a, a, a new Susan Laurie Parks play we did at the Public. But that was pre-pandemic, so yeah. So it's it's been a long time. Why do you want to go back? Can't wait to go back. Oh, there's just not the theaters. There's nothing. There's nothing like it, and it is um, the only like. Uh, the unique thing about that is the real-time relationship between actor and audience and story. And so um, <laughs> I, was, I was working with a, a film actor who'd never done a play before, and he was about to go do his first play, and he was really nervous, and I was like, you're going to love it. Um, and here's why you're going to love it is because it's the weird unspoken contract of it. They we're all entered in right now, too. Like, I could do anything right now. <laughs> I'm just a real person. I could throw this chair. 
<laughs> you guys could walk out. Like people, you know, if you had, you might fart. Like things that you know what I'm saying. Like real people do real alive things, mm -hmm. and that doesn't happen in any other mode of acting, right? And so, like, and. Also, we've all agreed that we're going to sit in here and tell this story. You guys are listening very respectfully. Like that, there's um, there's a, a danger in that and a trust in that that is really really beautiful. Yes. And um, and you only get that in real life in real spaces. And so that is kind of what I miss about it is that like a whole bunch of people entering in like not having signed anything to like ag agree that. We are all here to help tell this story, and we need your energy, and I'm going to give you all of my energy, and like we're also just here to tell a story. It like feels so small, but it's actually kind of the most important of human conditions. Is like when you can all get into the a room and agree to do something together. You know? Yeah, no, that's that's really true. Um, I mean, you're almost touching on some of the favorite weird moments of doing anything that's live, right? My show's live, and actually more and more people want to do less live, right? They mm. want things to be a little more predetermined, a little more pre-screened before things. But something, I think, gets... I think something gets lost. And I think that contract is such a reminder of so many things that we need in our society right now, yeah. right? Yeah. No, I think you're right. I'm, we, I think um, we mistake like a desire to be comfortable with it, you know, it's making things in your life easier is something that like we point to a lot with the various technologies that we have at our disposal, you know, but and easier is good. I don't know if we really want to be comfortable all the time. I actually don't know if that's what we want, but it is because it is easier and I am a person who will always do the easiest version of everything, right? I've always been that way. So, like, it's really, you can default to that pretty, like, your body will naturally be like, well, this is pretty easy, right? So I'm going to do that. Um, but I think we actually intellectually and spiritually want to be uncomfortable sometimes. So, like, but you have to, that's often going to be an active choice, which is difficult to get people to make. I'm reminded reading about a description of your, your hip-hop group clipping that it was described as sort of free to be weird, I think. Oh. Do you think that that's accurate? Maybe. Uh, Clipping is, there are, th are th three members of Clipping, me and, and Bill Hudson and Jonathan Snipes, and that music is the only music that the three of us can make together. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just like, it is an exact reflection of all the ways in which we are nerds. Uh, and so like, and it, and it takes all of our skill sets and meshes them together, and that's, that is the music that comes out. And so... To me, it is, it is very much that. And, uh, and we used to be, uh, try to be way more prescriptive about what people were getting out of it. And that is huh. so silly. We were young. We've been doing it for, <laughs> we've been doing it for 15 years now. So, we, you know, like, we, that was a, that's a bad idea, I think. You said something in a blind spotting interview, um, or an interview about blind spotting. Uh, I think it was South by Southwest. And... You said that a slogan you go by is um, energy up, expectations down. Yeah. What is that? What, what does that mean in your we had Rafael Casal have been saying yeah. that since we were 20 years old. And uh, it, if you decide to do something, you're going to do it. That's, uh, if, I, if I say yes to something, this is what I'm doing. And I'm putting my whole ass in it. Like, where this, I'm doing it. I'm putting every bit of energy I have. I'm treating it like it's incredibly important for the time that I have to work on it because... This is what we're doing now, and I will expect nothing in return. You know, generally speaking, I think when we were, because <laughs> we used to play the Berkeley Senior Center. You know what I'm saying? Like we used to we were, like doing rap songs in places where they shouldn't be, and like stuff. <laughs> and it was just, uh, and so, but we had said we were gonna do it, so we're gonna go put on a show, <laughs> and. Not only can we not expect to get any sort of financial return on it, because I still don't make money off rap music, we, uh, we also could not expect anyone to like it, <laughs> despite the fact that they asked us to come play this show. You know, like, so the, those things became really clear. So that, that just became the mantra, and it, it transferred into once we started writing together, it was just like this... It <laughs> took us a decade to write Blind Spotting, the movie. You know what I'm saying? We tried to get it made a hundred times before it actually got made. And then, like, once we finally got to make it, like, what a dream. That was it. All we had was making it. No one might ever see it. 
We, all we have is that we get to spend 22 days shooting this movie. Oh my God, what a dream. And if nothing else comes of it, that has to be enough. And I think that's true for, particularly for artists. Like it's gotta be, you just getting to do it has to be enough because there are no guaranteed returns. The last season of Snowpiercer, we shot the whole thing and then they shelved it. That's why it took two years for it to come out. The Zaslav just came in and was like, that's a tax write-off, we're not gonna air it. And so it wasn't for two years till AMC picked it up, which I didn't know was gonna happen. So we spent however much money, millions and millions of dollars per episode, we spent six months of our lives shooting this TV show that no one was ever gonna see. You, know? so you just have to, the doing, it has to be enough. It has to be enough because of things like that. But do yeah. you think there's also other are there other dangers creatively and expectations? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think when you get too deep into the expectations, me, I, I will start editing the thing in order to meet those expectations, right? I'm like, that's not useful either. Um, you just want your art to be what, what it is, you know. Or, uh, they're kind of time capsules, anything, at least the, most of the stuff that I do, they're like, a, at best, a reflection as a close to honest reflection as I can get to of how I was feeling at the time that we made it. And so like, that's pretty cool. But if you start worrying about what's gonna happen after you've made it, it's, no, it's immediately no longer that. Yeah. yeah. It was my forum producer, Mark, who made sure I asked a question about clipping because oh, he's yeah. a fan. Yes, thank you, Mark. <laughs> and uh, Love clipping fans. Yep. And so, yeah. you know, again, sticking to the, what has he done in the last six weeks? Uh, <laughs> so you released a new video. We did. Yeah. Run it. And I also read that this is like the first sort of new material release since 2020. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, our last album was in 2020. And there's... So there's a new album coming out in 2025? New, I, I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, there's a bunch of new music um, and it's, it's got plans for a release that I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about, but... Um, <laughs> sure. But it's... Um, yeah, but it is, uh, it's finished and it's good. It's, it's out there. It's all... Um, uh, we've been working a lot with like cyberpunk fiction. Yeah, we've been that's what I read. Circling around those themes and trying to translate that for us musically, and it's been really, it's been really cyberpunk. Fun. Why cyberpunk? It's just some, some stuff we were into. You know? <laughs> I think we actually got asked to write. It might have been run it um, for that uh, that video game cyberpunk twenty twenty or whatever it was that came out. We got asked to write a song and submit it for this video game, and I don't think they ever listened to it. They passed on it immediately. But, uh, <laughs> but um, we were like, this is a good song, and it's our next album. You know? So <laughs> we just, yeah. How did it feel to be, to be rapping, to, to be a musician, to, you know, again, right? I Oh, I never stopped that. Like, sure. we, we were making music. I, that's been the sort of through line of my life. I'm always making music. I was writing songs on the way here. I just, it's way, way Again, like the, the sort of energy up part. I don't know that anyone will ever hear any of the things, but that's just always been the, my motive. That's how I write things down. <laughs> yeah, how, what does rapping, songwriting give you that, that like acting can't, you know? Uh, it's just, it, it's more immediate. Um, it's a little more visceral. And it's, for me, like a good way to focus ideas, sort of. I don't diary or journal or anything. And I don't even write things that are that personal, but they do always, it, on their surface, but they do always end up getting to the heart of what I'm feeling at any given time. And um, I started rapping you know, when I was maybe 14 or something, I'd also been doing kind of slam poetry via Youth Speaks. Shout out to Youth Speaks. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but I was not a very good poet. Uh, I was a very good performer, and so I would win a lot of slams, but like the writing that I was doing and the writing that my peers were doing was not the same. Hmm. Then somebody like gave me a beat and asked me to start rapping, and I said, this is it. I needed the structure. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, more constraints generally makes me a better writer. And so that, that, that's how that works for me. When I was looking at all that you've done, all that you are doing, and all that's going on in your life, and I'm sure I only got a small sense of what no, it no, is. No, you seem like pretty but, good on it. <laughs> <laughs> but I wondered what role Oakland plays in the chaos of so much that's going on that you're doing. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Oakland, for me... Me and Raphael talk about this all the time, is that like the the Bay Area that we remember is a memory. 
You know, it's not the same here when you come here, but parts of it exist. Um, and that, but that memory for me, that spirit, is really foundational. I didn't latch onto it as tightly until I left for college, actually. I went to Brown University in Rhode Island, and it was like yeah. so different <laughs> from where I <laughs> grew up that, uh, that I began to define myself in opposition to that place, right? Um, so like Oakland for me became the anti-Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Don't print that out of context. But, you, uh, <laughs> but it, uh, no, but it, it, and it was, and also this is, this is 2000 when I started college, so like we're also kind of entering peak hyphy movement era, so also like the energy here was also different than it was anywhere on a, on a very grand scale. And so I would come home and be part of this movement and then go elsewhere and be like a, a, a fish out of water. But that became really important to me is that feeling of this is what home is like and I know what that is. And so it allowed me to exist as myself everywhere else because I had this grounding thing in Oakland, the sort of spirit of Oakland, the thing that um, the, that kind of memory of it is pretty foundational for everything. It is like, it's home base and, it, and having a real home, um, I think about this with my kid all the time, it's like, <laughs> situation's very different than the one I grew up in, you know, <laughs> Los Angeles and that kid's got money, like, like <laughs> And I'm like, I wonder what it is for him, you know, trying to figure out what, um, what is the thing that will allow my kid to really feel free enough to be themselves wherever they are. Because I think having a, a real defined sense of home it helps with that. Yeah. One of so many things you're thinking about when your kid is like six months right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. almost a year, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How's he going to function when he goes out to college? He ain't going to, no, it won't be college by then, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so Oakland sounds like an anchor, a, a grounding, a, a real centering kind of place for you. Yeah. You like to tell Oakland stories, I mean, blind spotting being one of those, mm -hmm. and then let's talk about the class and, the and class. why you wanted to executive produce it, just before I bring up the directors of the class. Yeah, I mean, um, the class, so there's, uh, there's, a, there's, I mean, it's really the reason to do it is because there's actually, there's an incredible young man who's here in, that, in the house tonight named Cam, who was a college advisor at, um, at Deer Valley High School. And we were incredibly impressed with him and wanted to follow him and see what he was doing with these students. And then a pandemic happened. Um, and everyone was like, what are we gonna do? And then it sort of became clear, well, we should still, someone should document this, you know? Yeah. Um, and so uh, the journey of like, getting there, and you'll, you'll talk to the filmmakers in a second, so yeah. we should bring them up, but the journey of making this began there, and now here, here it comes to KQED soon. So like the, it's, it's been a long time in the making, but um, I'm really, really proud of it. I think the, the students and Cam, uh, that journey that you're going to get to see is like really special and uh, indicative of a moment of a time in all of our lives that like we actually, and this is from being on the Hollywood side of things, like don't, they don't, we don't want to talk about it still, but it happened to all of us. Um, and um, so the bravery of the, of these, these students and, and educators going through this in real time, I find to be so affecting and so um, inspiring actually in, in, in many, many ways. So. Yeah, so let's the bring up the filmmakers of the class, Jay Fenderson and Adam Fenderson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so this, this series, as I understand it, that's going to air on KQED in the spring, it follows six students from Deer Valley High School and their counselor, Mr. Mr. Cam, what, what are people going to see these kids and Mr. Cam go through? I mean, you don't have to give away too much, right? But just <laughs> generally, what are some of the types of things, Jay, that people are going to see these students go through in this counselor? Wow. Well, first of all, thank you so much for bringing us here. We're so grateful. We have our four kids here in the audience. And um, <laughs> we... As David said, we all lived through this. And so I think, 
you're going to see a lot of the things that you all experienced. Um, whatever age you are, um, whatever stage of life, um, you know, these were difficult times. And we didn't know when we started filming that this is the story that was going to unfold. We actually thought everyone was going back to school and the pandemic was over. <laughs> so <laughs> By the time you were ready to start filming. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. And it was actually, you know, scary. And, and also creatively, we're like, how do we tell this story? Um, but yeah, the journey of the students, it's a classic coming of age story. It follows a, a six seniors through um, their senior year led by their college advisor, Mr. Cam. And you see everything that seniors do in a typical year, go, trying to get to college, trying to graduate, um, but set to the backdrop of the insane pandemic year that we all experienced. So. So we actually have a clip that you provided of the class, but Adam, do you want to set it up a little bit? Help Absolutely, yeah. We, like Jay said, the, um, the first days that we came out and filmed, we learned that they weren't going to be going back to class, um, which was really a change for us when we planned on filming them in <laughs> class. We were like, oh, okay, we're not going to do that. So then we, we interviewed Mr. Cam, and uh, it was like, okay, now how are we going to do this if we're not going to be filming the students in class? And the first thing was like, well, I'm going to have my first meeting with my students um, and it's going to be online. And so this is the very beginning of the film. This is, this is when you first, the first couple minutes. So this is very exclusive. No one's seen it. It's exciting. What is up, dear Valley? Welcome back to school. My name is Mr. Cam. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am the college advisor at Deer Valley all year long. I basically help with everything college related. I know we're in really tough times right now. We're all in shelter in place, but that's okay. We're gonna get through it. We're gonna work hard. I'm gonna be here for y'all. So thank y'all so much for coming. My name is Mr. Cam. This is a program to help y'all get into college. I'm gonna be your college advisor, um, but I do wanna do an icebreaker first. Basically, there's one person and you get 60 seconds to ask them a bunch of questions. Does anybody wanna go first? I'll, I'll go, go first. first. You wanna go first, uh, Cadence? Okay, no, we're gonna let you go first. Okay, you ready, Cadence? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready? Three, two, one, go. What's your zodiac sign? I'm a Capricorn. Capricorn. Favorite fruit? Um, peaches. Peaches. Do you have a dream job? Prosecutor for the state of New York. Oh, to New York. Okay, favorite cartoon? Chowder. Nice. Do you play any sports? Yeah, I cheer. Favorite Netflix show? 15 seconds. Black AF. Nice. Favorite video game? Fortnite. Favorite person? Last one. My granny. Yeah. Oh, okay. Granny is a favorite person. Abby's probably a little hurt. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was that was great. Wow. That's so fun. It's fun to watch with an audience. People are interested. This is a, this is something we don't get to do. We don't get to watch these often with an audience, and so it's it's wonderful to hear people. Yes, we're yeah. glad you laughed. That I know. <laughs> How, like, we think this is funny. But <laughs> How lucky did you get with Cadence and then oh. Mr. Cam? I mean, yep. I, is Mr. He, Cam? Where's Mr. Cam? Yeah, where He's is here. Mr. Cam? There he is. Hey. Cam walked into the green room and all I had seen was this one clip and I 100% understood as soon as Mr. Cam walked in why they were going to build a film around him. He is magnetic the moment he walks into a room. Yeah. So what was it going to be before the pandemic? Like what was the story going to be? It, it was going to be about students coming back after the pandemic, right? Because when, <laughs> right? Pandemic was just going to be a few weeks, <laughs> a couple of weeks before the spring break, and then we'll all be back in school. And then when, when we met, we were talking to Mr. Cam, we were talking to the school, and it was like, this is, we all kind of expected, hey, there's juniors that lost, you know, May and June, April, May, June. And that was really tough. And those juniors 
lost a few months and what is it going to be like to watch them struggle through their senior year kind of reflecting back? Um, and that was the plan. And then, yeah, that didn't yeah, happen. No. <laughs> it's totally different. And so, Jay, you had to completely, I imagine, reframe the story you were going to tell and how you were going to tell it. Yeah. I mean, the day that we found out that school was not opening, we called, uh, there's another executive producer on the show, Nicole Hurd, and we're like, I don't know if we can tell this story because they're not going to be at school. Like, how are we going to film this? It's and be also, one giant Zoom yes, call. Yes, exactly. Oh, and we're like, we cannot, like, we're all on Zoom all the time. Like, we can't do a show on Zoom. So I, I think this clip is a demonstration of how we had to think creatively within the constraints of not being in person. How do you create connection and storytelling that engages you know, an audience to stay tuned and, and see what unfolds. So you had people going to the students' homes in Antioch. <laughs> we met six incredible students through Mr. Cam. Uh, he introduced us to the students that he was working with, and we, you know, Zoomed with all of them at first. And it was really this hard question. is like, we would love to film with you, but we would love to tell an honest story of you at your home and with your family the way you're doing school now, and then you know we'll see when you get back to school. If you get back to school, we'll be on campus. Um, and that was that's how it started. And the, the students that we followed, I mean, they were it was we we're just so lucky that they opened their homes and their hearts and told yeah. us their their story. It was incredible. Because I'm thinking logistically, you know, we were so afraid and we had so little information. So how did you logistically try to make sure that people? you know, would not be spreading COVID, right? Oh yes. <laughs> it was like our constant was, fear. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It was this, we, we, I just want to start with saying we filmed for nine months and we never, COVID never transferred through our crew, through the students or anything. Now everybody, yeah. all the students got it at some point yeah. along the way, but it was like we were doing testing and checking. and Yeah, temperature yeah. checks every day before set. We had a very small crew too. So it was it's documentary. There were like three or four people <laughs> on every set. So it, Still, yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and everyone's masked and we're taking tests that morning and like checking everything. So we had, it's like, it was funny because uh, when we were doing the pre-pro call about this, I was like, oh my gosh, I have literally like, erased all of that from my memory. Like, I don't want to remember all the things. Like, do you guys remember all the things that we had to do and to stay safe and we didn't know? And that's so much of, I think, um, what was tough about this year is that we didn't know so much. And, um, you know, we had to. And I think you that see out. it in the film too, because the students didn't know. Yeah. Mr. Cam didn't know. The principals didn't know. Nobody knew what was going on. And every week it was new, more information. Every, you know, there's right. the national news, there's the local news, there's the California news. There's so much news. And it was, it was really tough. Yeah, because a lot of times you go in with some idea of what you're going to get. And, I was just really struck thinking about the challenge of, of learning along with it, right? I mean, as journalists, we were learning too and trying to report in real time what we were learning, but knowing that we had very partial information and it was all this constant thing. So, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about how you had to maneuver and if there are things that made this story because it was still happening so different than what it would have been if it had been post. And if there's like one example of something like that that you could share. My goodness, yeah. I mean, I think, I'm trying to think of, um, I mean, I think that overall, just the intimacy that we had with the students, I don't know if that would have happened had we been showing up at school every day in the classroom. Um, there's something about doing an interview with someone when they're sitting in their room and they haven't made their bed and they're like, this is me, I'm my authentic self. And, um, you know, I think we, always with documentary, the first couple of days that you're filming, everyone's aware of the camera, right? It's like, oh my gosh, like I want to make sure that I'm doing everything perfectly. And then... Kate, Kate is sitting there yeah. on the edge of her Yeah, seat. she's like, <laughs> very... <laughs> Zoom call like this. That was the first, first time we filming. filmed yeah. with her. By the time at the end, the Zoom calls are like, uh, Mr. Cam. Like, <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> so I think we probably got more honesty and access than we would have had we just been on campus. And I think 
as you watch, as the series unfolds, you'll just see like how much the stu how vulnerable um, and trusting the students were with their stories. Yeah. It is. I'll just as as someone who was just watching dailies and like also you know has been able to see it. The another incredible part of it all is this experience of being with other people while they were going through that. We were all alone. You know what I'm saying? Like every, you were with whoever you were with in your house at that time, and that was pretty much it. And like maybe you'd go on a walk, and like there'd be someone across the street. <laughs> You know, like, and that was the hype. And so to, it really is, like, incredibly affecting also to be with people, like, in their spaces. It feels, you know, it was a, a, just a reminder also of just how particular that moment for us yes. all was and how alone it was. It almost is, um, it reminds you of that and then also, like, makes it feel a little bit more okay because, like, they are also struggling through it and being very brave with it also. Yeah. You composed some of the music for... <laughs> We're using a, some music that I made a long, long time ago. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you guys have a great composer who's also making that all sound like it fits. We basically, <laughs> we basically took our our assistant editors and editors, and we're like, go find the music. We want to. It's a Bay Area story. We live in LA. I'm a. I'm from the Bay, and my family's here in the Bay. Let's go. I where, just where my the giant Bay Area, stuff. Where are you yeah. from, Adam? <laughs> my kid's got his giant stuff. We're very excited. I love coming up here. I'm a huge Giants fan. <laughs> uh, but, uh, we we um, yeah we were I'm from uh, Napa. Sorry. That's oh, where that's Napa. where I live now. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. You hang out there after the parents on my way. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want no a carpool? Way. Anybody want to go to Napa? <laughs> I'm saying I didn't drive up, so I need a ride Hunter, to Napa. <laughs> are you kidding? I would to get more time with you. Um, <laughs> so, but th at the same time, Antioch and Napa are very different, Oakland and <laughs> um, the East Bay. So th you have done, Jay and Adam, you have done educated education-related films before, right? Why, why do you like to focus in education? Well, it, we sort of stumbled into it. My first job out of college, I uh, went to Columbia University, and then afterwards I really wanted to work in film and television, and the first job that I was offered in that arena was at the admissions office, uh, <laughs> working on an undergraduate recruitment video. So I was like, I want to do that. Um, something in film and television, video, production. And so when I was there, I actually realized, working in admissions, how... Um, there's just so much inequity. And I had grown up with a single parent home and ended up at Columbia, um, not because I had you know, a lot of access or assistance. Um, you know, I didn't have a Mr. Cam when I was in high school. But uh, I realized, like, once you know something about the inequity, I think that has just sort of like entered into all, a lot of the storytelling that we do. And so the first uh, TV show that I sold was 10 high school seniors were trying to get a full ride college scholarship. And that was on ABC back in 2005. So <laughs> 20 years ago almost. Um, and I haven't been able to shake the fact that education in our country um, just isn't equally accessible to everyone. And if there's a way to use the power of storytelling to change that, um, I think I'm gonna keep trying to tell those stories and, and do that. <laughs> How about you, Adam? Um, I married into this. <laughs> uh, I, I grew up in Napa. I grew up in a privileged life. I went to wonderful, great schools, and I got to go to USC Film School, and I met this passionate woman about education, and I was like, yeah, let's make movies together. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. And, and I just, it, I mean, it's become my passion um, because, I mean, filming with, with students on all these different films across the country in different places and different situations and then meeting with university presidents and high schools and all, all these different educators it's really tough to stand back and watch um, education be such a slow moving train right to just to we we know that there are solutions out there we know that there are excellent organizations and ways to support students from all backgrounds to get them to better college and career life. Like we know that there is. Um, and getting people, and, I, and then a lot of people recognize it, but getting the, the 
universities and the community colleges and the states and the schools to work together to, to do it properly to support all these students has just been so it's disappointing to watch it go so slowly. And so then when we get, the, one of our first film was First Generation, our first feature was First Generation, it followed low-income students trying to be the first in their family to go to college. And we really looked at all these problems. And then it was really exciting because when we got to film with Mr. Cam, we're like, this is 10 year, uh, 15 years after we made that. And now we get to show the solution. Because having a counselor, an advisor, this is, we, we just did this in the car, this is silly. A counselor, advisor, mentor, a cam, a Mr. Cam, counselor, advisor, mentor. We need more of them. So we need more of them. Yeah. I know my, my interviewer brain is like. <laughs> no, it's so silly. Really we like, it was in the car when she said it. We were like, Cam, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so dumb. We're going to use it though. It's so good. Well, um, you know, knowing that he's, Mr. Cam is here now. I did not know he was yeah. coming, but my my interviewer brain just wants to ask him so badly. I don't know if we have a live mic, but it was like, how did having that year be documented, right? Having a camera documenting that affect the year, a year for you, right? Um. <laughs> Mike, come on up. Come on, Cam. My <laughs> baby. Uh, There's a lot of gems. But I don't think it impacted my advising directly in that way. Yeah. Well, I really cannot wait to see it and hear those gems. I guess similarly, David, I know that you are really active in educational advocacy, equity opportunities for people. Why? You went to Berkeley High, right? Went to Berkeley High. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Berkeley High was uh, a particular place in that it was, well, for a lot of reasons, but it, um, it has a massive course catalog, actually. You can take so many different kinds of classes there. Ki Swahili, Chinese, you know what I'm saying? Like African dance class, like the, the, it was amazing. It's a pretty big school, um, but all of these opportunities, and still uh, students of color, by and large, were like falling through the cracks, you know? Um, I, the, the ones who weren't were the ones who knew about these things, you know, who were, and who had uh, really involved parents who were like able to sort of teach you the things that are always helpful in education, which is like wait, wading your way through the bureaucracy of it, which like, <laughs> That shouldn't exist, but does, and so even even in high school it did, you know. Um, and so I am a product of oftentimes I think having access to a lot of things that people who don't who look like me didn't have access to through no real fault of their own, just because like they didn't learn how to effectively jump through the same hoops that I did. Um, and it has nothing to do with ability. Um, it's, it's literally just, it's bu busy work. It's not even busy work. You're like, go to the right office and talk to the right person and do the, and like, you know, um, or have someone to help you through that. And like that, that's it. And so, um, it just always struck me as like not particularly fair. Uh, and so, and I, and I have, I have benefited from all of these access. I'm, I'm actually pretty like 
whatever about college, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, if it's not for you, it shouldn't be for you. I think there are also other ways to be successful out there, but if it is for you, there's so much there. I go speak at a lot of colleges also, and like the first thing I tell students all the time is, you, there are facilities here that you should use. There's a lot of access to stuff for free here that costs money when you leave. And so like you should, if there's a room with a tool in it that you need, go use it. Or if there's a room that you need, go use the room. If you wanna learn how to play the piano, there's a piano in a practice room here that you have access to because you go here and you can go do that for free. Go do it now, now's the time. You know, Having access to those kinds of tools is one of the great things about college and that it's sort of a dedicated time to just do things like that mess around and try to learn something you don't know. And so I, I benefited from a lot of that and I kind of, there were a lot of secrets that, things that I didn't know were secrets that are secrets, you know? Like it, it ended up being cheaper for my family for me to go to an Ivy League school than it would have been for me to go to a state school, right? I didn't know that, nobody knew that, but it was a need blind admissions. And so like me, all of these kids are being told not to apply to Ivy League schools because you're not going to get in you can't afford it anyway. If you do get in, you can afford it. It's actually the only one they guarantee you can afford. <laughs> so like, go, why wouldn't you apply, you know? And why wouldn't we be subsidizing those, the opportunities to apply because there are admissions fees, right? So like $50 in order to then not pay for college, essentially, is like, that seems like a pretty fair trade-off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just being able to, for people to understand, understand what exists and, and how hard it is <laughs> to be able to understand all of those opportunities that, right. that are there. Um, there's been, I, I'm just curious, you know, this being an eSpace story, do you, there's been some suggestion that maybe it's more about Raphael, but just like really making Oakland kind of a place to tell stories to like, yeah, is yeah. that a goal of yours? Totally. I mean, we've, we've been working, um, with the, the city of Oakland and have, st you know, finally are, are starting to get some, some more reasonable like tax incentive for things to shoot there. Um, <laughs> there's, we just launched the, I don't know if you guys know about the blacklist, but it's, a uh, um, uh, right. So the, the blacklist is, a. Uh, um, writers can submit to the blacklist and they publish a, sort of a list of films every year that kind of are, are recommended films that didn't get produced, but they sort of have, are, fil are films that have been read by a whole bunch of people and that uh, everyone thinks are really exciting and they, it generally helps them find homes. So now there's like a Bay-specific version called the Bay List that if you are a writer from the Bay Area, you should be and you have scripts, you should submit to the Bay List and go on the blacklist website and you will find the separate link to the Bay List and it's... For us, again, like we, Raphael and I growing up here didn't know any other screenwriters, and so we had to figure out how to do it ourselves, and we also had to move to Los Angeles, right? And like, you shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> Especially since I've shot one thing in Los Angeles, as far as I can remember, since I moved there, you know? So like, there's no reason you should have to do that, especially if you're a writer. Um, and so that's kind of the hype behind the Bay List, and also we know that the talent is here. Um, and we were coming up doing these sort of Bay Area writer salons where we would just host gatherings for people who were writers to come share ideas, and there were always so many writers writing brilliant stuff. So trying to create more avenues towards production for artists from here. And it is um, what we are always met with in Hollywood is that like it's not, um, it's not yet a place that it's not played out yet, you know? Like there are stories here that feel unique and original, but that all, or that have a spirit that's unique and original, but that are human universal stories. And so um, I think it is really important to continue to tell them. And like, there's a market for them. We are hungry for them, so. Well, thank you so much for bringing this story, the class, all three of you for bringing this story and for doing that, bringing these, these Oakland, these Bay stories. This is- Thanks for talking. And thank you so much for Coming and Thank you guys. spending Thank time you guys. with us. Thank you guys. Thank you, Pam and your family. And, and thank you for sharing some of your some of your day with KQED. It really it really means a lot. And this is to all of you. Again, means so much to have you all here in this space with us. Robbie Diggs, Adam Fenderson, Ray Fenderson.